You have now arrived at your destination. Wes, I cannot believe it's been four or five years since we last made this happen. So much has changed, but thank you so much for joining me once again. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always fun to do this with you. Oh, it's so much fun. Uh, I enjoyed our dinner in London so much, but I want to start with a little bit on you. So tell me, how did you make your way into the world of venture first? And then how did you come to found FPV most recently? Yeah, I mean, it's always an accident, right? Everything in life is a, is a pleasant accident. And, uh, you know, I found my way into venture when I was uh, after, you know, almost more than 10 years at Google. I built some of Google's most interesting and, and, uh, and, and well-known products. You know, I started Google Analytics, uh, helped build the ad system, uh, help build Google Voice and help bring in a lot of the uh, the tech and Android. Uh, and after 10 years, uh, Google had ballooned to some large number of people, right? I think there were hundreds of people when I went there. And when I left, there were somewhere around 50,000 uh, or when I was thinking about leaving. Um, and in uh, 2009, I basically went to Larry and Sergey uh, and said, I love you guys, but, uh, you know, I've been 10 years here and uh, I missed the old days of being part of a very, very small team. You know, my best work on Google Analytics or on Google Voice was done when the team was less than 20 people, right? You could feed it with one or two pizzas. Um, and it was like a Navy SEAL mission. Everybody believed in, in accomplishing the impossible. Uh, and we, 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 uh, we built something that the, the world needed and the world appreciated. And you know, every time I go and give a talk at a conference, everybody raises their hand when I say, have you ever used or are you using Google Analytics? Uh, it's incredible. So uh, on, uh, when I told Larry I was going to leave and uh, do a startup, it was my dream was to go be a CEO and uh, build a startup and to found something to build you know, great products. Larry just looked at me and said, like, Wesley, look, um, I had to buy toilet paper when I started Google. I had to go and like, you know, shop for shop for paper towels and cleaning supplies and everything else and like buy health insurance. And uh, he looked at me and said, you know, that might not be your calling. So why don't you go and think about doing investing? You were great at buying uh, some of the Google's most interesting acquisitions uh, with uh, with uh, Urchin for Google Analytics, with uh, Grand Central for Google Voice. I helped with uh, Android and YouTube. And he said, uh, you know, if you're good at picking companies to, for us to buy and, you know, and they turned in some of Google's most um, iconic uh, products and services, uh, you might want to try your hand at investing. And we're starting Google Ventures. Corporate venture capital has been an utter distaste and a success and founders hate it because, you know, the, 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 the interest of the company that's investing and the interests of the founders diverge. And I want you to go build the venture fund that I would take money from. And, uh, you know, I helped to uh, help build and start Google Ventures with David Crane with, uh, with Bill Maris with Rich Miner and that original group of, uh, of four or five GPs and built Google Ventures uh, and spent five years there learning the craft of investing from some of the world's best venture capitalists. You know, some of them were on Google's board, Mike Marich and John Doerr, Bill Campbell, Brooke Byers. These guys were legends in the business. Um, and uh, it was just wonderful to be able to spend five years building it. And then Google Ventures got way too big. And uh, so I left and joined uh, my uh, really good friend and partner, Iden Senkit at Felicis Ventures, who, you know, built one of the most amazing seed funds, helped him build that. And then, uh, you know, as, 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 as I didn't built up Felicis, it, you know, got to a size where I said, I, I, I love you guys, but it's time for me to go back to my roots of being on a Navy SEAL size team where I can go and make decisions quickly and work with amazing founders in a way that's authentic and legitimate to me. And that's uh, sort of how we wound up uh, starting FPV Ventures. It's Peggy and myself and a couple of folks or five people. We move really fast. Uh, you know, we can decide on things in less than 12 hours sometimes. Sometimes we meet a founder and we say, you're amazing. You check all the boxes. We want to back you. Your mission is nothing short of incredible. We'll give them a term sheet on the same day and, and you know, sign it that night. Uh, we're that type of nimble fund. And like I said, uh, I, I work best on Navy SEAL mission-driven size teams where I can feed them with one or two pizzas. And uh, when you have that, you can just accomplish very impossible things. You're clearly not in the UK because our appetite would not uh, serve one or two pizzas. We'd need at least one per person. But uh, I, I love that approach. And there's no more exciting time than those really, really early days. I do want to start. I spoke to Don Stalter before yeah. the show, a mutual friend yeah, of ours. Yeah, I love him. Yeah. He said that I had to ask this one, which was in terms of the very early days at Google, working with Larry and Sergey in particular, what are the one to two significant product insights you have from that time? Yeah, it was it was really interesting. I still remember pitching Google Analytics and, and, and working on the ad system early on. And they just look at me and say, why are you wasting your time on this? Um, they always would push me and say, Wesley, you got to go work on something that changes the world. Life is too short. This is not big enough. And, you know, when you're 21 and you sort of hear this, like you just like your heart just breaks, right? You're sitting there going, I've just spent the last like two weeks coming up with this proposal and doing all this research. And you're like, you know, at this executive meeting with Larry and Sergey, the founders of, of the company, and they just poo-poo the whole idea and say it's not big enough. And that was the most, you know, amazing 
um, experience. It's stung in the moment, but it's, you know, one of the most defining moments where I look at this and go, is this big enough to go change the world? Is this something worthy of, you know, Google and worthy of my time at Google, right? Um, and it was one of those things where every time I would bring them a, um, a product or I work with or mentor other product managers or mentor other engineers that would, you know, sort of say, I want to go build this. I just look at this. I'm like, you know, Larry's and Sergey's going to rip you apart and ask the question, is this big enough for the world? And if you can't answer that question with a straight face, then you're not going to get this through. Like no chance he's going to fund it or approve it or let you go do this. And it's one of those things where, as you know, it affects my investing. I look at things like Canva or like Plaid or Gusto, companies that have done well, but like, you know, were not obvious when I did the investment. And I said, are, and I look at founders in the eyes. Are you doing this? And is it worth your time? And is it big enough for the world? And if they could answer yes with a straight face, I'd be like, I'll back up the truck. Of course I'll back you. And, you know, I was, I was able to write the first check in the, you know, companies like Robinhood or, or Plaid or, or Gusto or, or Flexport and, you know, because the founders had this dream of building something that would go change the world. And so that is probably one of the most, you know, unique product insights I, that, I, uh, that I had at Google was build something the world wants and that's big enough for the world. I still remember, I, 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 was, um, I was helping out my friend Brian Murkowski, who was the product manager at Gmail before it launched, right? And I still remember sitting in on the, on the product meeting with Larry and Sergey and, you know, the whole team comes up to, to Larry and Sergey and says, we're going to change all of, uh, of how people do email. And you remember back in the days, there was Hotmail and Yahoo, and they would give you 25 megabytes, right? And so they had written on their deck that we were going to give everybody 200 megabytes. It's almost 10 times more than Yahoo or, um, or, or Hotmail was giving at that point, right? And this was like long ago when storage was really, really expensive and hard drives, you know, cost like, you know, $1,000 a gigabyte or something crazy like that, right? And so Larry just walks up to the whiteboard writes down 200 megabytes. He said, this is what you guys want to give to people, right? And you, everybody in the room nods and says, that's, that's amazing. Like, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money. And it's going to be amazing. But we have these amazing algorithms of compressed data and everything else. And he crosses it out and writes two gigabytes. And back then, two gigabytes was going to, like, was insane, right? Like, you know, you look at the cost of storage, it would have bankrupted the whole company. And everybody just, like, in the room just gasps loud and says, like, oh, my God, two gigabytes. How the hell are we going to pull that off, right? And Larry's like, I don't want you coming back to me until you figure out a way to do two gigabytes of storage on their email for everybody. That's 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 massive. Number, uh, order of magnitude difference. And he goes, that's the product feature that people will go towards. And everybody just freaks out and says, oh, they're going to store the porn and their MP3s and they're going to store the video files on, on Gmail. And Larry's just like, you can solve that problem by just blocking the file types, so not letting people do that. And he says, like, the other non obvious insight is people are not going to fill up two gigabytes that quickly, right? It's going to be only like, you know, 0.1% of the users that are going to fill it up and like use it as a storage system. And you can block that too. And he goes, by the time people fill two gigabytes, like this cost of storage with Moore's Law will have dropped massively. And I'm sitting there going, like, holy cow, we, you know, we, you know, this, we could actually pull this off, right? And, you know, Brian and the team went back and like wrote down two gigabytes and figured a way to do this in such a way that, you know, this, this, that was the offer. And remember, everybody freaked out, like, you know, when they launched it, like invites only, they were selling on eBay for thousands of dollars to get access to Gmail. And it was one of those things where I just kind of looked at that and went like, boy, like this is an order of magnitude difference. And like watching that firsthand and live in that room of like, you know, creating, a, you know, what is today the most used email system in the world and watching that sort of origin story sort of happen in that room when they decided between two gigabytes and 200 megabytes, I was sitting there going like, holy cow, what if founders could pull this off, right? And that informs my investing. I ask founders and I tell the story, what's your two gigabyte moment? Like, you know, you're telling me something that's incremental and I'm looking for the two gigabyte when everybody else has 25 megabyte moment. That was Canva, right? Like, you know, like you look at Photoshop, you look at Office and you look at these other companies and Mel and Cliff, the founders of Canva figured out how to pull it off by building something that wasn't just incremental, it was revolutionary, right? You look at Plaid in the same way people were, you know, looking at logging in the bank accounts and having to do those stupid, you know, direct deposits and like, you know, write down the, the 16 cents and the 42 cents that, you know, people would have to deposit. It would take two weeks to go figure out how to like create a bank account. They reimagined that and did it instantly by like, you know, using... Uh, by building a product that allowed people to sort of sign on and onboard quickly. I mean, these are revolutionary changes for a lot of the products that happen. Those are the ones that, you know, I invest in and the ones that have served, you know, both the world, the founders and, you know, my, 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 my investing track record uh, pretty damn well. Right. So, you know, I look for those things that are the two gigabyte moments. Can I ask you, and this is where the joy of the show, we go off schedule. In terms of like, the, is this big enough? Often some of the best companies are built on insertion points or wedges that are actually quite small. Uber, black cabs in San Francisco. Uh, you can even look at Tesla, which is, you know, actually in the early days, the customer segment they were going after was incredibly small compared to what it is today, especially. Do you worry that you're going to miss out on the wedge smaller insertion companies by so having this requirement first? So, I mean, the wedge on Gmail was that they, they limited the invites. That was the magic, right? Like it wasn't open to the world and everybody used got two gigabytes. They had an invite only service for, you know, north of almost six plus months, right? And so, so, but 
the team knew what they were building and what they were going after, right? There was no question about two gigabytes was possible and that's what, what they're going to, that was the launch offer. And that was what eventually, you know, it was open, it was open in the world everybody got. And so, you, you know, the, the, the difference between founders who build the features rather than products, you know, this is something Bill Campbell used to say, Wesley, you should be building something that's a product and not a feature. Um, and I always look at the engineers that I had the privilege of working with. I'm like, guys, are we building a feature or are we building a product? If it's a feature, it's not worth our time. Um, same with the founders, you know, I have the privilege of working right with, you know, like, like, are you building a feature? Are you building a product? Let's go make sure we're building products, right? That people want. Um, this goes back to the, to answer your question, the founders know that they're building a product. The product may not be what it looks like at the beginning when they launch, but like, you know, I'm pretty sure Elon knew what his vision of conquering the world of electric cars was when he built Tesla. It wasn't like this thing where like, you know, he started and said like, oh, I'm only going to stop at the Roadster and, you know, just build that piece for rich people and like charge, you know, 500 grand per car. He was going to go and build the electric car that for the masses that was like $30,000. And that's what he did with the Model 3. It just took him like 10 plus years, right? So the founders clearly understand the vision. They understand timing. You know, Canva did not start out as what it is today. Like it is, you know, amazing today. It's going to get even more amazing as, you know, they execute on their 100-year plan, right? But every founder that invested in that are building products have the 100-year plan where they're going to go change the world, right? You know, Flexport didn't just start out as an import-export piece of software and stop there. They had, a, you know, Ryan had a 100-year plan. So it's one of those things where, you know, I've, 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 I've told this to my team as we invest. What the hell is a 100-year plan that the founder's articulating? If the founder comes to me and doesn't have a 100-year plan, I don't want to, I don't care. I don't want to be involved we don't just do widgets right do you not think that things change so much that actually planning so far out it can almost be futile do you know and I, I almost think sometimes it can be limiting oh like that's true for my life, life right it's true for my life i don't plan more than three years you know in advance and i don't even plan more than three days in advance like half the time people ask me to like commit to these vacations or dinner parties and i have no idea what the future will hold for me right but the truly visionary founders larry and sergey cliff and mel at canva you know the Brian Peterson at Flexport, they have 100-year plans. They may not, it may not, it may not work out the way they envision it to, but they know what the world looks like in 100 years and they plan to go build a company to you know, adapt it and make that happen, right? That is the big difference, they know. We have this really interesting kind of question here because we're speaking about the visionary founders that know, but then also the markets that they're knowing about and wading into. And I spoke to Victoria Felicis, who you obviously worked with, yeah, and she I said yeah. that, she said that you once told her the market always wins. And I've had so many guests on the show who say, it's all about the founder. It's all about the founder. It's the only thing that matters. We both hear this all the time. How do you weigh markets? How important yeah. are they? Yeah, the market always wins. I hate to say it, right? But the but it is also true that the founder is equally as important. I have founder, you know, I've, I've watched founders who don't have a good sense of the market, but they're brilliant founders. And they launch a product that the market isn't ready for, and then it goes to zero. It's a money loss, right? A market will beat out a great founder, but the best founders understand how to adapt to the market and find the bigger piece, right? Like it's it's sort of how Cliff and Mel were misunderstood. Oh, a lot of people pass on them because they said, oh, I don't I don't get the market, right? You're a Photoshop competitor, they're more funded, you know, only so many people are using Photoshop. And the market back then of people who use Photoshop were like professional designers, right? Or like people who were like advanced and would, were willing to take a class. Mel's actually unique insight because she was like a yearbook teacher in her in her uh, in her high school was that like you know people shouldn't be taking four years of yearbook class so that they can like you know learn how to use adobe products so that they can build you know yearbook in the last and final year of high school right and she said like there's got to be something easy where like you could get started just by like logging in and not having to like take a class to learn all these advanced features of like how to lay out you know and edit photos and whatnot but everybody misunderstood her market as a as a tiny market because like you know there was competition it was photoshop and in fact like, she created a whole new market of people that wanted and cared about design. And that's what Canva targets, right? That was the genius that, you know, Cliff and Mel had was the market's bigger than anyone ever imagines. So yes, the market always wins, but the truly visionary and incredible founders are the ones that understand that there's a new market to be created and they go create it, right? There wasn't much of a market for electric cars when like Elon, you know, started, um, Tesla, in fact, like, you know, almost, you know, the company almost bankrupted twice because his timing was off and like, you know, he was selling, you know, $500,000 cars with the Roadster, but he truly understood that everybody wanted one and created the Model 3. Look at the market now, right? Same with Larry and Sergey at Google, the visionary founders truly understood the market. Back then, every investor nearly passed on them because they said, oh, like we, we, we have, um, there's, we, we have 15 other search engines. You don't need another 16th one. And by the way, what the hell are you guys doing? It's a blank page with two buttons and a colorful logo. I don't get it. There's no market here for this. Everybody else is like, you know, doing sports scores. How can you compete? And look at Google today, right? They created their own market. And in fact, they had such a unique insight that the that the market did not appreciate the punch the monkey ads and the horoscopes and the sports scores because all those were designed to keep you on the damn site. And Larry and Sergey 
wanted to get you off Google as quickly as possible. And then they won out the market because they had the unique insight. Yes, you know, market always wins, but the truly visionary founders know how to create it or adapt it or like figure out the right market to go into, right? It's the ones that don't know how to figure it out that like have problems. So you're equally right that both of those are important. So for me, there's three different types of market scenarios. There's market creation, creating a new market or user need or behavior that it doesn't exist before. There's market expansion, which I would put Canva in, which is like there were designers, there were people who cared, but it massively expanded the town to a lot more people involved and included. And then there's what I call like market theft, which is like um, almost Robin Hood, like in some ways you could say that's market expansion, but neobanks would involve a lot of that, which is like stealing customers from incumbents because they provide shitty services that are out Updated in many ways. Do you have a preference for which type of market you favor? So I love all three of them. Um, but where I've where I've um, where I've done the best uh, is when founders come to me and say, "Oh, like this market doesn't exist yet, and we're going to make it happen." That's that 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 that's the goal, right? Like you know, when you when you have a founder that has unique insight and says, "Like I can create this. The time is right. The technology is right. I have the people on my back to go make this happen," and they go create the market, right? That's where that's where that's where the upside is. I mean, like my 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 outlier returns, uh, the companies um, that I've had the privilege of working with um, are ones that create new markets. Now that said, you know I've got quite a few companies that have done well on you know like what you call the market theft, right? Like look at Gusto, you know, look at the incumbents that they were working against. It was terrible. Payroll was you know hideous, and they said like we're going to create a better experience, you know, four dollars a month per user, and 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 they've nailed it, right? Like every small business I know is using Gusto. We use it. So it's one of those things where where I am, um, you know, the, there's ways to win in all three, but the ones that, you know, I've, I've, I've had the best uh, success in are, are ones where we create new markets, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I haven't succeeded in the other, you know, two that you've articulated. I find market sizing hilarious because, I mean, in the oh, I don't first do it. two... I don't do it. I don't actually, you know, look at the, say, is the market big enough? I just say, does the founder have a unique insight on a market that hasn't been created yet or that, you know, they're about to expand into? And if the answer is yes, that's where we back up the truck. Most, founder, most founders come up and give me this crazy slide. Oh, here's the TAM. Here's like, you know, some, some Gartner report that does it. And I just look at this and go, I'm like, I don't believe this. <laughs> Do you in fact, this the, in fact, the ones, the, you know, Harry, the best companies... Sorry to interrupt. The best companies are ones where the founder says, there's no Gartner report. There's no McKinsey and estimate on what the market sizing is. We're creating it. Those are the ones where I sit there and I'm like, ooh, I'm, let, me, let me get involved. How do, I, how, do I, how do I write a check? Do you think it's an effective exercise for founders to do? Because I've tweeted this before, very similar thoughts. And people go, well, Harry, fine. But it's still an effective mental exercise for them to do. And I'm like, is it? Really? Well, the, the, the more important exercise is the ones where you can truly convince yourself that you're creating the product and not the feature. The, the challenge for, for many founders that I've, I've heard pitching, this is not a knock on them. It's just something that, you know, folks, you know, maybe are taught in business school or I have no idea where they get this from. But they come and they said, like, you know, I, I, it's like they come and they say the market sizing for cars is three trillion dollars. And then they come and they show me a pitch for air conditioning knobs. I'm like, well, the air conditioning knob market is not $3 trillion. And then they go and they sort of like conflate those two things and go like, oh, like come invest in my air conditioning knob company for the, for the car. The market size for cars are $3 trillion. And then they conflate those two markets and then they convince themselves that like, you know, they're going after a $3 trillion market. And then they do this crazy math in the head. It's like, if we only get 1% of the market, we're a $3 billion company. And I'm like, ooh. Like I, th that's a lot of jumps in your head for like, you know, to turn a car comp to turn an air conditioning knob into a car company. Now there are truly visionary founders like Elon Musk who can go and sort of say, Ooh, like, you know, I'm going to start with the air conditioning knob and eventually build the whole car after it. But those are rare. So that's, that's, that, that's, that's the fallacy in market sizing, right? Is that people conflate that people conflate the, the, the feature part of their thing, uh, and the market size for that feature for that of the product, right? And that that's 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 the that's a fallacy where where founders get 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 screwed on their on their on their uh, on their you know sort of dream um, because they don't truly understand how to migrate from the feature to the product where they were never out creating a product in the first place. So it's not so much market sizing; it's like, are you really creating a product and not a feature? Okay, I'm, I'm so with you. When when I get the one percent and we'll be a ten billion dollar company, I always go, uh huh, good, good, yeah, I like that idea too. Um, uh, tell me, I, I kind of aligned but different outcome scenario planning is another model that a lot of VCs do as well. What does this take for it to be a ten billion dollar company? How big can we project this outcome to be to determine whether it's worth it? Do you do outcome scenario planning today when making investments? We do a back of the napkin uh, planning, right? So. 
you know, look, I can only do maybe 20 at most core positions in my fund. I have a $450 million fund we raised. You know, a lot of a, a lot of our LPs are charities and foundations. I think like, you know, 80% plus are, are, are charities and foundations and, you know, the rest of our friends, kids, college funds, right, that we're, that we're managing. You know, one of the nice things about being a, a, having such a, uh, having companies like Canva uh, that I've invested in uh, previously allows me to, to be picky about who our investors are, right? And I have to make the money. So I have to look at this, this, every investment that I do and sort of say, like, what has to come true for this company to return the fund, if not more? And so sometimes I don't even know what the steps are, right? But like, you know, I, I have to like at least convince myself and look my every one of my charities and foundations whose endowments that I managed in a straight face going like, I think this company has a chance to returning the fund. And then if you get like four or five of them, you return 5x the fund, right? And that's, you know, sort of, you know, my, my hit rates are around, around um, 30%, right? So, you know, one out of every, you know, three or four companies I've, I've hit, you know, are a billion dollar plus and I've been an early investor. So, you know, if, uh, you know, you do 20 plus companies and you have like a 30% hit rate, you know, you, that's like six companies, that's a you know, six fund returner if like, you know, you do the math. Um, but my point is that for that to come true, I have to convince myself that the company can return the fund. And so that's, that's where we have to go. And instead of doing scenario planning or, or outcome planning, we sort of say, what has to come true for the world to say this company is highly valued sort of thing? And sometimes I predict that I'm way off, right? Like, in fact, that's, that, that's where, I, um, you know, companies like Google, like no one expected it to be worth, you know, trillion plus. Like I still remember in the early days when it was a couple hundred people, we said we were happy if the company was worth over a billion dollars, right? And, you know, it's a trillion dollars now. So it's one of those, you know, two. Um, it's one of those things where, where um, you know, we, we, we go through just to convince ourselves that there's a chance that it can happen. And that's that's the case. Then, um, you know, we'll do the investment. Now, there are companies that very, 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 very hard to do that. Right. And that's why we have, we, we, we don't invest in them. You know, I'll give you an example, like a, 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 a restaurant. Do the math. Like, you know, there's just very few restaurants. They're usually chains or like, you know, private equity firms where they're valued north of the billion. So there's sectors or markets or areas where like we just can't. You know, when we even look at the math and sort of do this through the, you know, whether you call it outcome planning or like, you know, sort of, you know, understanding what the, you know, possibility to returns are like, they just don't return the fund. So we, 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 we tend to sort of, you know, wish the founder much uh, luck and give him a big hug and sort of say like, you know, this is not, you know, something I can go back to my children's hospitals and, and whatnot and say that we can, we can make them a lot of money on this. So 20 core positions, 450 million fund, we're looking at 20, 20 million dollar checks if we do net of yeah, fees. Yeah, yeah. 10, 10, to, 10, 10 to 20, that's what we look for. 10 to 20. How do you feel, I had Brian Singerman on the show from Founders Fund, he said capital concentration limits are the enemy of great fund returns. Do you agree? And how do you think about capital concentration on a per company basis? Uh, you know, I, I actually look at it slightly differently. And this is something I learned from my dear friend Iden at Felicis, which is we, we like more shots on goal. Like if you're in some company like Canva, right, you'll return 10x plus the fund easily, but you have to be in a company like Canva. And so, so the more you concentrate unless into the companies, the less chance you have of finding companies like Canva. That's the, that, that's my strategy, right? Like, you know, and I started, you know, I helped to start the seed fund at GV. So, and I didn't also, you know, started Felicis as a seed fund. And so he and I have this preference for having more great companies in the fund then and, and and we can always concentrate capital later on through through other vehicles, right? You know, you're you you're quite you're quite an expert at, at understanding you know the, some of those those strategies in place. But like we'd rather have more core positions so that we give more shots on goal than than to than to um, than to sort of say like I'll do three companies and like you know pray that one of the three companies works, right? Like, you know, I'm, uh, if you do the odds uh, in, in this business, you have to have just enough to get a high confidence of returning. You know, I studied electrical engineering when I was at MIT. Like, you know, when you study statistics, then you, you want a high confidence score. And I want to be able to go to my LPs and like the way I've constructed this portfolio, I have a pretty high confidence of returning the fund multiple times over on these checks. So that's why I prefer, you know, doing more companies than less, but you have to be good at Would picking you and you have to be good at saying no. Uh, so how important is ownership then? And then would it not be better for you to do five to $7 million checks and write 45 to 50 of them? And have that diversification well if you know series a rounds were done at five to seven million dollars i would totally do it right but like you know they're most of them aren't like you have to sure like we have a 450 million dollar fund so we can write and back founders all the way right like the capital that we have is uh, is designed for us to sort of go to the founder and say if you're raising 15 million we're here to back you for 15 if you want to raise five we'll do five right like you know we're, we there's no hard and fast rule that i subscribe to another thing i learned from you know, I didn't, uh, you know, at Felicis, like, you know, we, we, we get into the best companies and we do what we can to get into the best companies. We don't go and have dogma 
Like, you know, I, I did not have 20% ownership of Canva when I led the Series A. I did not have a board seat. In fact, so many people said no to them because they said, we're not giving you a board seat. Or they said, we're not giving you 20% ownership. Or they said, we're not going to do X, Y, and Z. And remember the dogma back then in 2014 when we were discussing the deal was 20% ownership in a company located close to you, not run by a romantically involved team. And a board seat. And basically, we didn't get any of that from Canva. And I, you know, I was one of the few people that said, in fact, the only person that said, yes, we'll write the check for you because we really believe in what you're doing. And fine, we'll waive all these things that every other VC is saying we have to have with the ownership requirements and everything else. And Canva is you know, sort of the Lifetime Achievement Award, right? Like it's going to return so much of the fun for Felicis. I'm such, and it's one of our, it's one of our investments in, in, in my new fund. One of the first that we did because it's such a, an amazing company that continues to scale and build you know, products that people want. That's... That's the thing where if like, you know, I had to subscribe to some dogma about ownership or subscribe to some dogma about board seats or whatever else, I would not have gotten in or I would have said no. It would have been, I, can you imagine me missing out, uh, you know, on, 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 on this company because I had some dogma? I, I totally agree, but there has to be a line. And it's, you know, I have this, I always have this, which is like, you know, I, I'm lucky because of the brand and the media platform. I have access to a lot of great deals, but there has to be a line of it's worth it enough. Doing a 100K check in a seed round. Yeah, if Canva came to me and said, well, you leave the Series A for 100K and have like 0.001% ownership, I, you know, that would probably would not work. But they didn't. Exactly. There's, I mean, this is the market, right? There's some market efficiency that will work out between the founders and myself. And we say, like, look, let's make a deal that you want to say yes to. But at the end of the day, like, you know, I don't need 50% or 20% or whatever other funds, you know, are requiring for their for their model to work. We have a very flexible model to be able to win. So that is the that is something again that I learned from from my my wonderful colleagues at Felicis, and you know, it's it's near and dear to my heart today to build a thing, to build a, a set of terms. To make it easy for the founders to say yes. You said about board seats there. Um, and there still is dogma. And there's still ego around boards. Um, yeah, I, I don't care. I didn't get a board seat. I'm on the board of Canva today. But I, you know, they said, we don't. We love this. We don't know you well enough yet to give you a board seat. And I was like, fine. I don't need one. In fact, if I, like, I if I go to IPO with a board seat, I'm fine. But they said, mostly, I, I, like, we, we trust you. So we want you on the board now when we, when, I, when, we, when we led the Series C at Canva. So it's one of those things where I'm not, I'm not dogmatic on this. In fact, I, you know, my preference is to only take the board seat if the founder wants it, right? Like it has to be something the founder wants, not not what I want. Okay, but do you think boards actually add value? I've sat on many with some great people. They don't really add value. I, 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 maybe one has added value. Again, again, that's the founder's decision, right? If my being on the board adds value to the founder, he wants it or she wants it, I'll totally do it. Their but founders are like, I don't, want you, you, I don't need you on my board. I'd be great. Do you feel boards do add value though, generally? It depends on the board, right? Like the one on Canva adds lots of value, or, or at least I think it does, right? You're going to have the Cliff, you're going to ask Cliff and Mel that, but it's a small board with me and Rick Baker and the two founders, and we have really wonderful, lovely discussions about you know how they want to move forward and what their hundred year plans are. I, if it was a twenty person board, we would not have those discussions. Then I'm on some boards that have like 10, 15 people on there. You know, I sort of sit there and I just like sort of you know I'll go to the board meeting. I'm like, ooh, like I'd rather not be here, right? Because like you know I'm about to there's not much value that the board has and everybody has a different opinion and the founder spends more time managing it. This is really up to the founder for me. Like I'm only, I'm only willing to do it if the founder wants it. Right. You mentioned leading the series C for Canva there. There's often a, a thought that actually in your best companies, you're never able to concentrate capital because the Sequoias that you name your big funds will come in and take a big bite out of them. And so you're never able to concentrate capital across rounds in your best companies and increase ownership. Do you agree with that thought or do you counter that given your experiences? I mean, it depends, right? On Canva, we were able to concentrate more capital. And by the way, Sequoia came in on that round too with us. It really Gosh. depends on, look, this is such a, this business is an art, right? There isn't a hard and fast rule of let's go do X, Y, and Z and that's the pattern. In fact, the VCs that subscribe to hard and fast rules that have dogma are usually the ones that get knocked out very quickly. I, I, I totally agree. It's the art. It's the Come art on. of the. It's the art of the deal, right? Like everyone's a custom, unique boutique deal. That's what we. That's what we spend time doing, right? And we just make it easy for the founder to say yes. You said about kind of making terms that make it easy for the founder to say yes. In terms of the fundraise process, I saw a LinkedIn post that you put out, I think it was in June, and you said, wait and stay put. I'm intrigued when founders are contemplating raising today. Like, talk to me about the wait and stay put thinking. I'd just like to understand that. Yeah, you know, I had a lot of founders say, hey, you know, I, I want to raise now. It would be great to, to go out. And I sort of said, like, look, the market's just completely 
changed. A lot of VCs don't want to be pricing a falling knife, right? Like, can you imagine like doing a deal in your fund and then like three months later, it's like worth half as much and you have to go to your LPs and explain that? Everybody's, you know, everybody's sort of thinking about, you know, what the new market sort of is and what the new reality is. And so, you know, my, my counsel to founders was like, look, if you don't need the capital, don't, don't go out there with everybody else desperate to get capital right now because everybody's out in the market, flooding the market going like, give me money. Like, you know, normally, you know, I, the, the one data point I had was when we announced a fund, right? Like I've announced a bunch of funds before for my previous, um, for my previous uh, firms that I worked for, right? Like, you know, I'd get a couple hundred people saying, oh, it'd be great to, um, it'd be great to, to talk to you about raising money. And then, you know, this time around, I, you know, my inbox and my LinkedIn messages and whatnot was flooded by over like five or 6,000 people saying, I need money. From some firms that you may have heard of, right? Like, you know, I'm, from, I'm actually from some companies you may have heard of that you read about in TechCrunch. And I just would ask people, how much do you have left? How much cash runway do you have? And everybody, you know, was like four months or less, right? So that is, I mean, the people out raising have had at that point to be out raising. And you don't want to be lumped into the system where like, you know, if, if, if you have the cash, you know, you're out with a bunch of other people that are knocking down and banging down every door because they might run into cash because a lot of people aren't doing as many deals as they were a year ago. So I just said, like, uh, hold on, let the market reset, then figure out what the right strategy is. And if you have quiet LPs, I mean, if you have quiet investors where you can raise, you know, uh, some more money quietly and you know, do it at terms that you're excited about and that they're excited about, mm -hmm. then go do it and shore up your capital pool. But don't be out publicly raising because everybody that was out there had a bit of desperation in there. And so that was that that was the impetus for it. And, you know, we, we, we got a lot of people who said, oh, well, I totally hear you. How do I find quiet capital that's willing to do it or, you know, go to folks that know me and that, you know, that served some of the founders well that had access to that, right? Like Guild was able to raise a great round from investors they knew without being on the market. And they were one of the big success stories of being able to get up rounds, even when everything was falling. Every GP is telling their LPs, now is the best time to be investing. Now is the best time to be investing. Um, and I'm intrigued. Do you actually agree with that? Or do you think we're still in No, it's the best time to have a fund. It's not the best time to be investing, right? There's a lot of treacherous de deals out there. Like, I don't know when, when, when there's these re market corrections, uh, what winds up happening is the credit and capital market seize up a little bit, right? And so the challenge is, you know, uh, you have no idea who's going to write another check into your company. And so you might be the last check into that company. And so it's very treacherous. Like you like imagine finding like some company that has four months of cash left, right? And like, you know, you're, you have a, a 25 or $30 million fund and you say, oh, I love what you're doing. Let me go write a $4 million check in your company or whatnot and concentrate capital in there. And then, you know, from that, that, that last 12 months and, you know, the markets are still seized up then because who knows how long this last, you know, money policy isn't, you know, funding more capital into the markets. You know, things are... VCs are still sort of skittish and waiting for the markets to reprice. So a lot of them aren't doing deals. And then the founder comes back to you 12 months from now. It's like, I'm out of cash again. You just put four. I need another four. What are you going to do? Nobody else is knocking, you know, giving, returning any phone calls to the founders. It's treacherous. So you, it is a great time to be in great companies, but it is not a great time to invest because it's so easy to make a mistake because you might be the investor of last resort for that founder and then have to have to either shut down the company or keep writing checks in that company until the capital markets like, you know, free up a little bit. And so there's, there's some, there's some, um, there's some treacherous behavior that uh, one has to be careful about as you're looking into this market. Do you think it's the right time to be aggressive to select assets that previously would not have taken more money or did not need more money, but now might have a mindset shift of actually having more. Oh money yeah, no, that's what we're doing. We've, 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 we've done, we've done at least seven deals so far, right? Since, you know, and our fund is like two months, you know, two months launched. So we're being very aggressive and we're being very thoughtful in terms of what we're putting capital into. But in most of them are companies that I've known well, the founders that uh, know me well and that like, you know, have no need for more capital. I, I totally get you and I agree in terms of the- So the, the answer is, the, yeah, it's great. This is a wonderful time to be into those companies, but would I be doing a company that comes to me and says that two months of cash? And, you know, we if, if you write us a check and it will last us 12 months, uh, you know, it, it's a great market, like we have a great founder and like, you know, two months of cash, I probably wouldn't do that deal. I, I Not totally now. agree with you. Uh, can I ask, we, we've spoken and we've heard a lot about Canva. I think you also learn a lot from misses. When you think back to your misses, what's the most prominent one for you? And what, how did that change you as an investor? I think, um, you know, I've had, I've had quite the anti-portfolio, right? Like uh, one of my big misses was Twilio, you know, Jeff Lawson, um, you know, I was the founder of Google Voice and, you know, had built that for multiple years and knew a lot about telecom and kind of said, like, oh, I'd love to have, you know, the the Google Voice um, founder 
my cap table, would you invest? Uh, and this was at the seed round, right? Like when I was at GV and he's like, I, you know, and I passed on it because, you know, I looked at it and, you know, talked to my, my team at Google voice and everybody looked at it. It's like, Oh, this is easy to do. Like, you know, once the company gets big enough, they don't need to anymore. Boy, I didn't understand how much he would evolve the product, how much he would change. That was a big miss. My, my, um, my lesson learned on that one, and, you know, many of my other misses is that when you're an expert in the area, you know too much and everything becomes hard as a not invented here syndrome, especially if you're, if you're a classically trained engineer. And so, you know, my best investments like Canva or some of my life science investments, right? You know, Orca Bio or, or Zillis or, or, uh, or, or, uh, you know, these, these amazing life science companies I've had the chance to, to be part of, like, if you know just enough to be dangerous where you can believe the founder, instead of having all the skepticism going, no, it can't happen. That's where you do the best, right? So I, 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 I try not to take any pitches in the areas I know too much about because I have a natural bias to pass on it and say, say no. And I'd rather, you know, have one of my colleagues or partners who don't know enough about it take the pitch and then like be really excited about it and I'll go sit there and poo poo it afterwards. And if it survives that and the deal gets done, then to have me go and like have the natural bias. That is literally my biggest set of misses is ones that I knew too much about. My biggest misses were, well, some of them were Riverside, which we're on now. Uh, every round, Descript, which we use as well. Yep. Every round. Mm-hmm. I knew too much. Eight years in podcasting. No, no yeah. one would ever use this. It. Ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love too much. To... I like these tools. I'm too used to it. Like you just hate, you hate everything you know too much about. I, my question too is, you said there about Twilio, you know, you know, people will scale out of it when they get to a certain size. I find this is a big investor mistake that people make and that you could make it with a number of companies. Uh, like Algolio as well. I, I know a lot of people did the same. Like, do you agree with me in terms of that? And how do you get over that? Oh, well, actually, when a company reaches a sudden scale, they'll scale out of it. It's uh, my, my comfort level on getting over that is you really have to truly understand. This goes back to that thing about building products and not features, right? The founder's vision and the 100-year plan. Like what, what the, the, my biggest lesson learned on investing is that what you see today is not what, if the founder's truly vision, it will not be what the company is a year or two years or five or 10 years from then. So you have to really believe that the founder is capable of morphing the company and the set of products into something that's truly incredible. That's the piece that I spend most time doing. I don't ask them about what the product is today or all the problems or issues that customers have. In fact, like a lot of time, like I'll do customer references just to understand what the limitations are. But like, you know, my, 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 my early lessons of investing where the, you know, and I missed out on quite a few companies because I, I, I listened to customer references and listen, listen to them bag or hate the product. And I was like, Ooh, we can't invest in this customers hate it. Um, it really, this goes back to the founders. This is a founder truly one of those incredible product visionaries that's capable of morphing both the company and the product into something that's truly visionary. Now, can you imagine meeting Elon Musk and thinking about Tesla when he only had the Roadster and you, you know, everybody's thinking, oh, he's only going to build these $500,000 cars for rich people that are electrically driven. And you sort of sit there and go, ooh, I'm not going to do the deal because I don't think Elon can morph the company into something where the Model 3 and these other great cars that he can create at $30,000 price point is possible. The company changed, right? Like, so you have to uh, truly believe and listen and hear if the founder is capable or has a plan to change the company, what the real you know vision of the company is versus like what the company might be today. That was the piece and my biggest learning lesson in doing this business for 10 plus years. This is such a base question, um, but I, I have to ask it. If you're not asking about kind of product intricacies to determine level of product mining quality, how are you determining how they think about product planning and that 100 or 50 year plan what questions does one ask? How how are you planning product? Like, no, you happen? don't ask that because you know they don't. They'll give you a. The problem is if you a lot of people tell you what you want to hear versus what you what what, what you're you're doing questions. So you have to ask it ten different ways, in ways that make sense. And you know, again, that's one of those things that I want to give away the trade secret of how I do it. But like you, you you're you have to ask it ten different ways and listen carefully. And if the answers are consistent, you can truly differentiate those that are product visionaries than those that 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 aren't. Um, you know, people try, you have to do it in ways that people can't game, right? Like, you know, if you ask what's your product planning, you know, people can game it. They create a roadmap or they have a friend who works at Google, create some product roadmap, and you look at the roadmap and it all looks really legitimate, right? But it may not indicate their ability to really, truly understand what the company needs to morph into, right? That's the piece that, you know, is the art in this business. And that's, that's one of those things where, like, you know, you sit there and, you know, having been at Google where I got to build and work on and dream up some of the best products, you know, that the world uses today. Like, you know, you just have to listen to that and say, is this founder capable of that? I was talking of dreaming up products. When you started FPV, what was the product that you wanted to dream up with FPV? Is it a multi-stage fund that is multi-billion dollar fund? No, the product is simple. We're an investment firm where at the end of the journey, the product, the founder says, you know, 
you're, you're my, uh, you're one of my first phone calls. That's it. Whether you IPO the company and we make billions of dollars for, you know, some of the children's hospitals we whose money we manage, or whether you, uh, you we shut off the lights. At the end of the day, the product is simple. You know, you have a relationship with me where you know I'm one of, you're willing to say I'm still one of your first phone calls. Is it multi-stage? Is it multi-geo? It can be multi-stage. It's multi-geo, multi-stage. I mean, you know, the only thing we're not touching right now is crypto. Um, you know, the, the founders. You know, look, my best company that I've had the privilege of working with is Canva, which is located in Sydney. And it was, you know, an NGO that wasn't obvious when, you know, I, 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 I led that deal at Felicis, right? And so you never know where the world's most amazing founders will come from or where they live or where they might be hiding or where they, what they might be doing. Like, you're, oh, this is a business of pleasant surprises. You just have to keep an open mind. But when you find that and you spot that amazing and amazing founder that's going to be the next Larry or Sergey or Cliff or Mel at Canva, like, you, you know, you kind of sit there and go like, I want to work with you. Let's make it easy for you to say yes. And so if, it's, you know, if I was, again, I'm not dogmatic, right? I don't say I have to own um, 20% ownership or, you know, be only in the U.S. or be in places where I have to be able to drive to. I'm willing to, you know, like some of my best companies, like I said, are in sectors that, you know, people are like, I don't understand it. why you're in it. Sometimes, you know, there's this joke that, you know, my my old firms and that some of my colleagues would have that, you know, and in fact, Don calls it sometimes, it's called the Wesley Head Scratcher. When I did Canva, it was a Wesley Head Scratcher. I don't get it. Australia company, romantically involved founders, like, you know, they haven't launched revenue yet, you know, $100 million plus valuation. No one got it, right? Like, in fact, like everybody's like, that's a head scratcher, Wesley. What are you doing this? And it turns out to be the Lifetime Achievement Award, right? And so it's one of these things where you just have to have an open mind and not be dogmatic about stuff. But like when you spot that product visionary, and again, that's what I index on is product visionaries right then you go and you back up the truck and i'll take i'll take the risk that most other people won't and so that's how i invest i'm not saying it's the right way of investing but it's what served me very well and there's you know the lovely thing about bc is there's hundreds of if not thousands of different ways to make money and be successful at this business that's just the one that's authentic to me totally with you i think there's a brilliant quote which is the best investors have the willingness to be lonely for long periods yeah. of time yeah um, I, I mean i don't mind i don't mind doing a, uh, an investment and wandering the wilderness but you know after you know, look at Canva, right? After, you know, eight years of doing that deal, everybody looks at it and goes like, oh, I can't believe I passed on that deal on the Series A. I'm like, but you did. In terms of the founder types, you mentioned the product visionaries many times. Does that exclude sales leaders who start companies? Does that exclude CMOs who start companies? Do they have to have product at their core for you to really excite? Some of the sales people, uh, some sales you know, leaders and CMOs have lots of product expertise. You have to remember, they're close to the customer. They've explained to the customer what the product does. They, you know, in their previous jobs, have learned what the shortcomings of their products are. So some of them make the best product people, right? But not all sure. of them. So it's one of these things where, again, that's that's what I index on, right? It's the art of spotting that because that's what I, you know, spent 10 years of my life doing and being trained by some, by folks like Marissa Meyer or Susan or Salar or Larry and Sergey building products, right? Like, you know, that's something when you see what excellence looks like, you can spot the excellence, you know, so what, 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 what my LP said, it takes one to know one, right? So, yeah, you know, that's one of the privileges that I've had in um, in having the, the journey that I've had is that, you know, I've had, you know, the ability to spot what excellent product people or work with what excellent product people, you know, it's kind of what, you know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger said, you know, the, the standards, the, the best gift you can get people is high standards. And I have exceptionally high standards on product, right? Can I ask, you've just been through the fundraising process for, for Fund One with FPV. What advice would you give to um, other managers raising their first time fund, having been through it so successfully? Um, boy, like what a crazy story, right? Like I started fundraising like three days before, you know, the whole, before Russia started invading Ukraine, I thought it'd be screwed. Um, and you know, it's very terrible what's happening there, but, um, there's this irony, like I, I invest in boring money making businesses, right. Or it's, or, or, or in life science companies that like, you know, create new drugs to cure cancer or whatnot. Um, and one of my LPs had this, you know, sort of ironic insight, you know, I raised the fund pretty quickly. We were able to close in, you know, less than a couple months. The, uh, and we were, you know, almost uh, two, if not three X oversubscribed uh, in the commitments that we were able to take room for. And we capped it at 450, right? Versus, you know, being able to be greedy and taking more money. And the reason we did this was we wanted to be very disciplined in our, in our, in our approach to investing in great money making businesses. There's only so many of them. And we want to be super picky and be disciplined in uh, being limited in what we can invest in. If you have unlimited capital, you start you know, being loose with capital and invest in not high quality deals. So we decided uh, 
to, to have the strategy of saying, we're going to invest in boring businesses that make money and not fattish businesses, not crypto. In a year ago, I, you know, one of my LPs had this interesting insight that said, like, you would have had more problems raising a year ago because everybody had these strategies like crypto and Web3 and whatnot that, you know, are are not making money today. Um, and uh, you would have you would have been seen as, you know, just some traditional investor. And in fact, like, you know, with the markets changing, with crypto crashing, all these scams where, you know, poor, you know, little ladies are being ripped off by, you know, these crypto, you know, so-called banks that have lost all their money. Like, you know, we look like safe harbor, right? Like we do traditional venture capital in businesses that have revenue and we plan out, you know, exit scenarios that, uh, that, that, that were, you know, if these multiples hold, these companies are like long-term valuable, they're critical to businesses, they're timeless. In fact, that's, you know, sort of the pitch that we gave to our LPs is that like we invest in timeless companies. So look, I, it's not for me to tell other managers what their strategy is or how they do it. I'm sure they have authentic strategies, but the, the, you know, the one piece of advice I gave myself is just go back to your roots and do what's authentic to you, which is great businesses that make money, that we can get in at fair prices, that the world will always value no matter, you know, there's a recession or there's a disaster or whether the times are good. And, you know, that served me well. Final question for you. You're a learning machine. I know you're a concert pianist and uh, a complete rock star on the piano, among many other things. What's your learning process, Wesley? Boy, you know, I hired, when I tried to hire a piano teacher and, uh, you know, I was a disaster. They, you, know, you have to learn the scales, you have to learn your sheet music. And I said, I just want to learn Chopin. And, um, yeah, nobody would wouldn't teach me that. So I, I learned, uh, I basically learned using a, uh, using YouTube and, and then, uh, so you learn that there's two things, um, that, that, that I sort of broke down the learning process into one was, um, the mechanics of it and the technicality, where do I put my fingers and how do I, and uh, you know, for how long? So you, you learn that on YouTube, you figure out the fingering for it. You like, you know, practice one hand at a time, you get that right. And then the second piece of it is the mastery of it. Like, you know, some of the world's best artists, Arthur Rubenstein, uh, Garrick Olson, how do they play it? Right. And like, what is the nuances that they do? to master the piece. And so like, you know, we have all this stuff in Chopin, which is, you know, very emotive Roboto, which is, you know, that's the, that's the whole timing element where you robbed in the past um, to give to the future. Uh, you know, so the timing isn't consistent. Isn't just like one, two, three or mechanical. And you listen to them play it and then you duplicate as much as you can in their timing and in their emotive sense. And then you learn those two things together and then you get to mastery, right? It's the same with venture capital. There's the mechanics of the, of the, uh, of doing the deal. Anyone, can be a venture capitalist. Anyone can issue a term sheet. Anyone can go find a great company. And then what's the art? That's the mastery of it, where where you you know you go from, you know, being just mediocre, or you're to being average in, in venture capital, having outlier returns, um, in outlier companies like Canva and Gusto and and Plaid and whatnot. And what are the what, what is that one edge that you can master that you can do it slightly different than everybody else, so that you have a you have an edge that people can notice and that, you know, pays off in the end that compounds. Right. And that's the piece, you know, in the piano, it's just like really, truly understanding. And, you know, my edge there is just breaking it down into, you know, certain timing elements where I think mathematically about how long to play each note and sort of like, you know, how much pressure to sort of apply to the key. And then you can sort of create something that like is a slightly different interpretation, but people still think it's good. So that's my lesson. What, 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 what is that art in venture? I agree with mechanics. Anyone can do it. Anyone can read portfolio mechanics books, understand that shit, but what's the art then? For me, for me, my art and my edge is again indexing on the product visionary and finding that founder that says, "I get product and I get what this company can be in a hundred years." And when I hear that, I back up the truck. And when I don't hear that, I'm like, "Ooh, let me do some more digging." And if I can't unsurface it, and that's a that's a deal that I tend not to do, right? So it's one of these things where that's my edge, and everybody has a different way of doing this. They have a different art and they have a different way of succeeding. That's what makes this business so exciting, right? Like, because you learn from other people's mastery of it, and you go, "Oh, I would not have thought of it that way." And they have this amazing sort of ability to have this edge that no one else has. And I look at it and go, is there something I can learn from that? Is there something I can, you know, I don't want to use the word copy because that sounds completely unauthentic, but is there something I can adapt into my behavior change or my investing? If the answer is no, then I just go, oh, I'm not going to do that. Right. And if the answer is yes, then that's another piece I add to add to my mastery of this business. So I think that that's the piece is that, you know, I, uh, I, I love getting the mastery. Well, you know, I, still I, have a long way, I still have a long way to go on this, but like, you know, at the end of the day, that's why I love, you know, meeting folks like you and everybody else who approaches venture capital in a slightly different way and go like, what is the piece that you've mastered and what can I learn from it? I think my mastery was realizing that there were many more people who were much smarter than me and deciding that a podcast was the best way to extract knowledge from people who wouldn't normally give you time. Uh, <laughs> it works. But, uh, I, 
It works. Amazingly, VCs yeah. are more than willing to talk about themselves. Uh, but um, I do want to move into my favorite, which is a quick fire round. Yeah. So I say a short statement. R- rock and roll. Favorite book and why? I'm going away next week. What should I read? Uh, favorite book, Liar's Poker. Michael Lewis. Um, and Michael Lewis is one of the most amazing storytellers on the planet. And he tells the story of the mortgage crisis back in the 80s. It's just amazing. A lot of interesting analogs to what's happening today in, in the markets and in venture capital. What is your biggest strength? What is your biggest weakness? Uh, biggest strength is uh, empathy with founders, really truly understanding the part of their, their journey. Biggest weakness is I appear really awkward to folks just given my like sort of uh, engineering upbringing. Cliff actually um, at uh, Canva, I mean, we had such a great chat about you, but he asked the question, which was, what are non-obvious learnings for founders to think about navigating hyper growth? Uh, it, it's really the empathy that they have with their employees, right? You know, the best founders like Cliff and Mel have massive empathy with their employees, especially as you're growing, because you can just imagine like, you know, you were walking in the company. I went through this first hand, you know, when I was at Google, where the company was doubling every, every, uh, every, every two months. And, you know, you can just imagine how, how unfrazzled everybody gets, you know, in a business where like it just keeps growing and you're like every day is different and you walk in and it's uncertain. And so you just have to have an empathy with your employees and truly understand that, that they're going through their own journey and they've joined you on that journey. And if you can demonstrate, communicate and understand, have that empathy, like, you know, you can go, you can go to the moon and back. What is the most contrarian opinion you have on the venture space today? Uh, you know, it's probably, I was one of the first to like, boohoo crypto um you know it's, some of it's done well but like i said like i can't be involved in a bunch of stuff where like i think more than three quarters of it is scammy I, you know I, like i said i manage children's hospital money and last thing i want to do is like oh i'm sorry i lost your money in a scam and we 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 we, we, we took we took advantage of a bunch of little old ladies um that's contrary and a lot of people thought i was crazy when i said that and you know some of it's coming home the roost now as we see celsius and voyager and some of these other companies like really take you know a lot of retail investors and a lot of them you know folks that aren't very wealthy or don't have much money or you know they took their life savings and ran off with it it's terrible what have you recently changed your mind on um you know it's uh i think god that's an interesting question i changed my mind like eight times a day on stuff um you know pega my partner bought a deal uh, in a in a to me that i thought was in an area there's payments that i thought was was hard or terrible and, you know, she basically said, no, uh, look at the, you know, founder's vision on this. And I said, like, oh, well, in that case, I'll change my mind on it. And, you know, we would wound up doing the deal. So, you know, I, I, there's this famous quote, not famous quote, this famous saying when I would pitch stuff to Larry where he goes, Wesley, if you have the data, you're right. If you don't have the data, then I'm right. And you don't want me to be right because I'm often wrong. So bring the data. And so, you know, I think that that's how we operate our partners meeting is that people bring data. And, you know, when that happens, like, you know, we have a productive discussion when not, it's a bunch of people yelling and opinions. And, you know, that usually causes people not to change their minds. If it's just random opinions. You can take one luxury to a desert island. What do you take? Uh, one luxury to a desert island. Um, boy, I would, I would probably take... Uh, I would probably take my iPad, but there'd be no communication. But uh, that's, that's, you know, there's so much information and reading uh, that I love learning on. Final one, my friend. What are the next five years for you and for FPV? If we have this conversation in five years' time, what does FPV look like? Where are you at? Um, if there's, you know, I always do this planning exercise with my founders. You know, write down the things you want to be true in five years. And I wrote down like three things that I want to be true. One, we remain a small team. Two, we have a family of founders who, you know, vehemently tell everybody else we're their first phone call. And that like, you know, anytime I have a problem, whether it's like a therapy issue or like a fundraising problem or a product issue, Wesley and Pega are my, my, um, my, one of my first phone calls. And, you know, I, I, you guys need to work with them because, you know, they'll be one of your first phone calls too. Uh, and then the last thing that I sort of say is that, uh, you know, we, everybody on our team continues learning and like, you know, understanding truly like what, 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 what brings them fulfillment. Like we started this firm so that everybody that works with us can be fulfilled on what they do, not because, you know, the money is always secondary. And like one of our core values is that we want people to be fulfilled and, you know, we want our founders to be fulfilled in what they do as well. The money is always secondary. Wes, this is such a joy. You know, I always so love our chats. Thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait for the coming years with FPV and uh, many exciting years ahead. Awesome. Well, Harry, it's always a pleasure. You are here, my friend. Thank you.